hadn't seen it yet this year. If I'd been thinking far enough ahead, I would have found some clippings and you could project it on the screen up there. But I'm sure sometime in the next couple days, somewhere in the Lincoln paper or somewhere on the television screen, we'll hear those two iconic visions of the changing of the year. The old man all crumpled over the passage of an old year of time. And that rather impish looking little baby, often wearing a diaper and a top hat, but that isn't an interesting combination, I'm not sure what it is. A diaper and a top hat welcoming in a new year. The passage of the old, the beginning of the new. The changing of the guard, if you will, and the passage of time. It always struck me as something rather Endings are often associated with sadness. You think of lost opportunities. You think of lost time. My wife's 96-year-old aunt died a little over a week ago. I think she was in the last Monday. 96 years ended a life no longer to be lived. A mother no longer to be cared for or to care for her children or grandchildren. There's something sad about being getting old and, lose, and we losing them. On the other hand, beginnings are usually filled with a sense of anticipation, excitement, joy. We don't always know what's going to lie before us when we begin something, but at least there's usually the hope that it's going to be a good experience. It's kind of ironic to me how the conclusion of an old year gives birth to the hope of a new year. And with that hope is usually the expe expectation that somehow the new year is going to be better than the old one. Those are the kind of thoughts that came to my mind as I first read lesson that I just shared with you a moment ago. The encounter between Joseph and Mary and their newborn son, Jesus. The two rather elderly people, Simeon, we're not told how old he was, but the image is always that he was rather elderly. And Anna, a prophetess who was 84 years old. Now that's at the time when life expectancy was about 35 to 40. Anna was by the standards of Two old people in the temple of Jerusalem welcoming a newborn, no, not quite newborn. Jesus would have been about 40 days old at this point, as his parents bring him to the Jerusalem temple to be dedicated. That's the scene. The temple in Jerusalem. According to the law of God in the Old Testament, at the 40th day, parents were to bring their newborn child to the temple to fulfill two Old Testament rituals. One was the purification of the mother. After 40 days, 40 days after giving birth, the woman needed to be ritually purified so that she could be welcomed back into the polite society. But more importantly was the ritual of the presentation of the consecration of the firstborn. Every firstborn son would be dedicated to the Lord as a sign of God's special gift to that family, and giving them that son to carry on the family name. And so in obedience to God's command, Joseph and Mary would have brought the now little over month old baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem, a huge place, a mammoth structure, hundreds if not thousands of people milling about in the courtyards. They had several different courtyards in that temple, milling about doing those things that were customary for temple worship, offering sacrifices, lifting up prayers, a number of different activities. And in the midst of it all, two elderly people are drawn to this young couple, Simeon and Anna. Can't help but think of old man time and the baby new year, and the kind of image that that must have presented to the people standing around. There is a sense of excitement with 
both Simeon and Anna, if not anybody else in the crowd, for the hope of meeting this child had been the focus of their life for years. Simeon is described as a pious, God-fearing man. He knew God's promises. He knew that one day God would send Mashiach, the Messiah, the Greek word, the Christ. God would send one who would fulfill his promise, not only to his people Israel, but for, the, for all the nations of the world. And on this day, Simeon was given the vision. But perhaps more likely, in his arms, the fulfillment of that promise. It reflects that triumphant faith. It, it reflects that expectant hope and joy. I'm going to paraphrase these words. Lord, Lord, now I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever you have in mind. You've shown me how much my life is in your hands. Now I've seen your promise for Christmas was on Thursday this year. Some of you may have taken Friday off. You had Saturday of the weekend, and of course now it's Sunday. And for some of you, it's going to be back to work tomorrow for the first time. For some of you, you may have gone back to work on Friday, or maybe even Saturday, but it's back to life as usual. It's back to the routine. It's back to what we normally expect life to be like. Vacations are over. We've got children in the family. That they got, guess what? They we're with my grandkids. Some of them are broken already. The wrappings have all been bundled off the recycling or the trash. Some of you may have even started to put away some of your Christmas decorations at home. A couple days after Christmas, and you almost start to feel it, that kind of I don't know if it's depression necessarily, but there's certainly a change in mood as we come off the, the height and the high of family celebration and time together and go back to, to life as it's always been. Perhaps one of the reasons we fall, fall victim to that is that all too often we treat Christmas kind of like a birthday. Come together, you have the cake and the punch, and you do the family kind of things. And whoever's birthday it is gets to add one more number to the end of or to their, their age. I get to do that next week. And then we go on with life. I would challenge you. Think of Christmas not so much as a birthday party, but as the day of a birth. And for those of you who experience the birth of a child, remember the joy, the sense of excitement, and the sense of anticipation that comes with that. I don't think there's a parent alive who is so naive think that their children will never give them any sense of disappointment or frustration. That their children will always be the source of joy in their life. And always give a sense of contentment and peace. They'll never cry. They'll never wake up in the middle of the night. They'll never dirty home. Parents are realistic enough to realize and to recognize that life is going to be filled with its ups and its downs, that there is going to be hurt, disappointment, 
and sometimes may even anger at a child's misbehavior. Children are not perfect. But somehow, on the day of a birth, none of that makes any difference. It doesn't take away from the joy. A new life has begun with all its potential, with all that we look forward to. That's what Jesus' birth is all about. A new life has begun. Not just his, but yours as well. God is doing a new thing. He is living a new life for you and in you. And that is what strikes me as lying at the core of Simeon's song of praise. Christmas isn't just the story of sweetness and light that somehow holds off the darkness of winter days for a little bit. Because when you really get right down to it, Jesus' birth is not all sweetness and light. In fact, there is a lot of darkness associated with it. Simeon realized that. Did you hear his song? This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel will be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And then looking Mary right in the eye he says to her sword will pierce your own soul as well. Next time you get a birthday card don't expect to read that. A rather strange man very strange words. This child will split the world, separating God's faithful people from all the rest. Those who are joined with Christ by faith, who will be raised on the last day to a new and eternal life, and those who are disconnected by unbelief will forever live under God's judgment and condemnation. A 40-day-old infant. And in him, Simeon and Anna see the redemption of the world. The sin-bearer who would sacrifice himself for the sake of all people those who believe in him might be brought back to God by the power of his forgiving grace. A powerful witness. There is no one. Their message continues to be heard. It continues to be heard through the ministry of this church. It continues to be heard through your witness to members of your family, to those with whom you work, to neighbors down the street those with whom you go to school, knowing and believing and serving this Christ is still a matter of life and death. The old has passed away. God has begun a new thing, a future that lies open before us by the hand of his grace. Christ has come to live among us. He has come to live for us. The Spirit continues to live in us, guiding us to serve Him according to His will. That new life is yours. Yours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.